Hello there, my fellow masters of the desert, and welcome back to another lore video from the rich universe of Dune. Last time we talked about the Fremen practice of summoning and riding a sandworm, along with the two most important pieces of gear required for that. Today I'm gonna tell you a few things about a topic that at least one of my subscribers has requested multiple times, and that is the famous Fremen Chris Knife. Unfortunately there is not a huge amount of lore behind this iconic weapon, so I'm also gonna tell you a few things about the Frem Kit at the end, which includes a lot of the tools and items required for desert survival. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? So, what is a Chris Knife? A Chris Knife is a knife, obviously the blade of which consists of a single tooth of a giant sandworm, and this item is considered sacred by the Fremen. Supposedly no offworlder who ever saw one of these weapons could be permitted under Fremen law to leave Arrakis without the Fremen's consent. In fact a number of never explained deaths on the planet have resulted from the enforcement of that very law. Once the blade is drawn out of its sheath, supposedly, it could not be returned unblooded even if the blood has to come from the owner. To do otherwise would be to insult Shai Hulud and risk bringing his wrath upon the Fremen. This object of veneration is a milky white blade, about 20 centimeters in length, giving the impression of glowing dimly in the light. The teeth were brought into a siege only infrequently. They were only obtainable when the Fremen found the remains of a dead sandworm. When such a find was made, as many teeth as could be safely carried and stored were removed from the carcass and taken back to the siege for blessing and manufacture into knives. Chris knives came in two varieties when they were produced in the siege factory. They were fixed and unfixed. A fixed blade, which could be stored for an indefinite period of time, was treated to exposure to a series of electric currents which fixed the blade's electric field and kept it static. An unfixed blade remained stable only as long as it remained in contact with a living human body. Deprived of exposure to that body's electric field, it weakened and crumbled in just a matter of hours. Surprisingly, this kind of weapon, the unfixed one, was the most commonly used by the Fremen, since it was frowned upon that anyone should be able to obtain a Chris knife by looting a dead Fremen. Fremen, who knew that they were either gonna be captured or killed in battle, without sufficient time for their blades to disintegrate afterwards, would find the closest available rock and shatter them. The tip of a blade, the hollow once occupied by the tooth's nerve, customarily held a small amount of the most deadly poison available, most often a mixed derivative of native desert plants. The Fremen usually attempted to avoid killing a respected enemy with the tip of the blade as the poison was considered more of a weapon to kill an animal and not a human. The mounting of the blade into the handle was patterned on the so-called kinjal. This was another type of long knife popular in the Empire, with a blade almost identical in length to that of the Chris knife. Where they differed though was in the shearing guard. The kinjal generally boasted a stout guard while the Chris knife only had the raised lips of its round handle, where it joined the blade to protect the user's hand. Some authorities believe that the earliest versions of the Chris knife were deliberately constructed to mimic the Kinjal, a blade that the Fremen were already familiar with from their many generations of service in the Empire back when they were the Zensuni. The later changes, including the elimination of the shearing guard, came about when the Chris knife became a more iconic and unique weapon, rather than just a native copy of an off-world knife. The blades were surrounded by considerable mythology. The Fremen cherished their Chris knives, giving them names, which were held secret from all the other troop members, and they protected them with their own lives. When the Chris Knife's owner died, the weapon was treated differently from all other possessions. The handle of a Chris Knife was the only thing that was taken to the funeral plane for burial after the owner's water was returned to the tribe. The one exception to that custom was in the case of a Chris Knife whose blade shattered during a battle. Fremen superstition held that in such a case, the person had somehow offended Shai Hulud 
who then retaliated by withdrawing his mite out of the tooth. The Chris knives are also surrounded by a good deal of history. The initial acceptance of Paul Moadib among the Fremen, for example, actually came about when his mother, Lady Jessica, was tested by the shut-out Mapes and deemed worthy of possessing a Chris knife. The original Duncan Idaho, who had proven himself in the Siege of Stilgar, was also allowed to keep one of the sacred weapons. But, of course, the blade which attracted the most historical attention was undoubtedly that of Muad'Dib himself. When the first emperor, in the guise of the preacher, was killed, his son, Leto II, took the knife as his own. In the centuries that followed, Leto II made a lot of ceremonial use of the blade. In addition, the god emperor would control the tiny supply of the knives that remained during the last centuries of his rule. While his so-called Fremen Museum carried out the old rituals with them utterly ignorant of the real reasons of their actions. The fact that one of them could copy a Chris knife for sale illustrates the degeneration of the custom. No real Fremen would have ever permitted such a thing for any reason, least of all for financial gain. The Chris knife of Muad'Dib, then, could be seen as the last of its kind, in a way. A blade carried by one who knew the traditions and the myths that held it apart from more common, less holy weapons. While the Fremen of old might have disapproved of the use to which the God Emperor put their former leader's knife, they would have certainly approved of the level of veneration that surrounded it. Among the Fremen, the basic survival kit in the desert was known as a Frem kit. Until more recently, the term Frem kit itself had been loosely applied to any and all material carried by most Fremen when they were outside of the siege. Nowadays, however, it seems likely that the Frem kit contained a specific set of practical items, and was owned but not always carried by most Fremen males. This shift in understanding came when one reference in Paul Moadib's first handbook was re-examined. It was assumed that this phrase in the oral history referred to the Kitab al-Ibar. Then it was realized that a desert survival kit and accompanying instruction manual, mentioned in the work Traveler's Introduction to Arrakis, likely referred to the Frem kit. At this writing, two incomplete versions of that instruction manual have been discovered. They are small film books, with mounting hardware still attached, requiring glow tabs and magnifiers. Both micromanual fragmentary versions contain the same listing of survival equipment. Unless contrary evidence is discovered, it will have to be assumed that these items made up a frame kit. The litter johns, the still tent, energy caps, Recaps, Sand Snork, Binoculars, Rep Kit, Sink Chart, Paradise Pistol, Filled Plugs, Paracompass, Maker Hooks, Thumper, and Fire Pillar. The work does identify each and one of these and mentions their general function. A complete kit, packed in a small bundle and cleverly fitted with shoulder straps, weighed in at about 10 kilograms or 22 pounds. A complete Frem kit was probably not carried in the field every day, though. The inclusion of litter johns, for example, suggests that not all items were regularly carried outside the siege. These big water containers were carried for individual use only under unusual circumstances. Similarly, the Baradai pistol, which was used by specialists for marking spice blows, would not be part of everyone's traveling kit. Binoculars were heavy. Sink charts were almost useless if one traveled close to home, and the fire pillar was hardly an everyday device. The possibility that the Frem kit may have had other symbolic or ceremonial significance is also suggested by passages in the manual. There is mention of such confidential matters as the riding of sandworms and the uses of melange in both food and manufacture. The manual was obviously not supposed to be seen by an outsider. At the time, scholars were testing the hypothesis that the Frem kit and the instruction manual would be presented together to a Fremen youth at some point in their transition towards adulthood, maybe even as a rite of passage. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the iconic Chris knives of the Fremen and the Frem kit for today. 
Definitely the Chris knife is a weapon with a lot more significance than just your average blade. Also, while we did describe some pieces of the Frem kit in other Fremen videos, like the steel tent, the steel suit, the thumper and the maker hooks, there are still some items like the paracompass or the paradise pistol, which I will cover in a future equipment video. So if you are a fan of the Fremen and their equipment, do stay tuned. Otherwise, what are your thoughts on the Chris knife? Do share them or any questions you may have in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please support the series by watching, sharing, liking and subscribing, as these do not get a lot of views on the channel. Thanks a lot for watching and may the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.